the 3990X is unbenchmarkable. It's remarkable that it's unbenchmarkable. It's remarkable that it's unbenchmarkable <laughs> and that I have the hiccups. There's so much I want to tell you about the 3990X and Threadripper in general. It's been an incredible adventure. I've been testing the 3960X and the 3970X and now the 3990X alongside the W3175X Xeon from Intel. It's a 28 core, $3,000 monster. The whole line of Threadripper 3000 CPUs has the potential to change the computing industry for a long time, pretty much the next several generations of computer actually. The Threadripper CPUs that we have right now today, I just, I don't see Intel responding to them for, for like a year. I've been banging on them as hard as I possibly can, and I can't really find a significant downside or flaw. We could talk about the 256 gig memory limit, but you know, for the 3990X. Now for the launch of the 3990X, I did a build video with Micro Center and I did a whole suite of benchmarks. I think that flew under the radar a little bit, but I actually did get to do a lot of testing with the 3990. Now, visual effects artists are getting all the love with the launch of the 64 core Threadripper, but I'm here to talk about two other use cases that uh, the 3990X can be great. The Threadripper 3000, uh, processor family in general can be great and the use cases here will scale reasonably well up to even 64 cores for some of the workloads at least I mean I can't just throw benchmarks at you though because I mean I, I don't say it lightly when I say it's changing the computing industry and if I throw benchmarks at you without talking you through them it's not it's not it's not what I want We've got to talk about these benchmarks and the performance and how AMD is changing the whole industry. I mean, it's like, you can go all Senator Freenak here, it's a fake. Well, this 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 one actually is, is a fake. It's just, it's just a dummy. But let's talk about Gromax. There was this kerfuffle when Intel published some benchmarks of Gromax running on Xeon versus their own like Intel testing Threadripper. Now, Gromax is a versatile molecular dynamics package. It does Newtonian simulation of uh, systems with hundreds of millions of particles, I think, in, in most of the simulations. So when we talk about how long does the simulation run, it takes a few days to simulate a few nanoseconds. Now, in a lot of ways, the angst over this Gromax benchmark a while back, is not really justified. But true tech journalists are facing a little bit of a squeeze right now. Most, most journalists are. I mean, eyeballs on an article translate to dollars and intrigue and mudslinging well, it gets a lot of looks and clicks and it goes to the bottom line. So uh, it's not a great situation. But the story here isn't that Gromax and who's faster and what's going on with that. It's really one of optimization. Now, Intel has a lot of software developers. They know how to optimize code. You can't take that away from them. And actually, AMD has Intel's optimization team to thank for some of the thumping big wins that AMD has enjoyed lately. Yeah, I know, it's a little bit of a controversial opinion. It's not like Intel is, you know, one entity shambling aimlessly into the future. There's a lot of people that work at Intel that have a lot of different agendas. See, with Gromax, it's better to get uh, better scores through optimizing more than anything than just throwing more watts at the hardware. And depending on what hardware is available in a CPU, things like the AVX2 instruction sets or AVX512 in the case of Intel or FMA or optimizing loads of data, uh, you know, load and store and doing the calculation or maybe we can load it up front or we can stream it or whatever, maybe having the large cache. Those kinds of things uh, can lead to much more efficient computation. And that's really just optimization. It's not really changing the hardware. Now Intel's results aren't directly comparable to mine for Gromax, but I did do my own testing of Gromax with the Pharonix test suite. And the Pharonix test suite is not as optimized as it could be, but it's repeatable and fairly well documented. Now Intel has their recipe site, which I think actually AMD probably needs as well. So where the Pharonix test suite is kind of a recipe for doing some testing, Intel has a website where you can get some recipes, but it hasn't been updated. The Gromax one's not been updated since 2017. And if nothing else, I'm Wendell and this is level one, I can at least explain to you how we did the tests. So 
if you look at the Intel software site, it gives you a rundown of Gromax and getting Gromax and running the test and doing the stuff. It's like super boring, nobody cares, it's from 2017. But it, it does talk about a step here where you're optimizing how the compiler is gonna compile the source code. It's gonna build the program specifically for the CPU. And you see that a lot with research type applications and even like developer type workloads, which is what I'm gonna talk about, where you uh, run some kind of a test on your hardware to find out what's best, and then the compiler will actually build the program with that in mind. So, back to our Gromax graph. 2.941 is a little better than average on open benchmarking because openbenchmarking.org is where the Chronix test suite uploads. And the average there is about 2.5 or 2.486 in this particular result. So 3.377 for the 32 core and now 4.438 for the 64 core. Now the 64 core is not gonna be twice as fast as the 32 core for anything because 64 cores is still working within that 280 watt power envelope. There, there are a lot of disingenuous people that will look at the growth in the performance in the benchmarks from 32 to 64 cores and disingenuously say, oh, I didn't double in performance. Oh, the AMD scaling is terrible, but it's still 280 watts. Depends on what you're doing as to whether or not more cores will actually help you. And some things actually do speed up quite a bit. But uh, because of that 280 watt power envelope is also why the base clock on the 3990 is a full 900 megahertz lower. So we can't expect the doubling of performance with a doubling of cores. What can we expect? It depends. It depends a lot. And that's why I felt like that we had to have this sort of conversation because I'm not sure that everybody has a complete understanding. So with timed compilation, things you know, like the Linux kernel, LLVM, and GCC, we get wildly different results moving from 24 to 64 cores. The Linux kernel compile, for example, it comes in at 23.84 seconds on the 3970X, but it's 18.91 seconds on our micro center build on the 64 core. Now, that's not really 23 seconds to 18 seconds for $2,000. That's not really, uh, it's not really much of a performance uplift. That's not even, <laughs> I know we're not expecting double, but I'd expect more than that. So that's the same optimization problem that we were talking about before with Chromax. And this optimization problem is how AMD is changing the computing industry. Computer scientists just haven't had this much computing horsepower before. Any of the CPUs in the Threadripper 3000 family, at least affordably and on their desktop. So it's exposing problems and you, you have to ask the why. Why is it that it only speeds up from 18.91 seconds to like 24 seconds or from 24 to 18.91? And so that is what the rabbit hole, the black hole of insanity that I've been sucked down because it gets super interesting. Pretty much anything is super interesting <laughs> if you go deep enough. Check out this patch to the Linux kernel from just a few days ago. Phronix also did a write up on that. And it's really just, you know, a quick and dirty summary, but it's a change to the way that the Linux kernel handles uh, sort of a primitive synchronization pipes uh, for compile jobs with make across a large number of cores. But it substantially improves the build time for compiling the kernel because it solves a problem in the Linux kernel that, well, just didn't matter until people had so many cores. It also didn't matter as much until Intel had a lot of security problems. Wait, what? What, what, what does Intel's security problems have to do with this video about the 64 core CPU and the, the kernel patch to speed up compiles? Well, some compiles anyway. Well, yeah, Intel engineers, they're the ones that are responsible, at least partly, for this patch. See, one of the things that Intel CPUs struggle with is when you switch from working on things that belong to another part of the system. There's this idea of like system processes and user processes. And when you think about security, it's like the things that are, you know, secure need to stay secure. And when the Intel, you know, an Intel particular core in the processor is doing some secure work and then doing some insecure work, that's a context switch. And Intel CPUs, turns out they, don't do that as securely as they should. And so you minimize the amount of context switching that you have to do as a part of running the compile job. You solve this pipe problem and then you get a huge performance uplift. Uh, but it turns out that in, uh, AMD will also get a huge performance uplift because, but their hardware, you know, does it. So these mitigations, you know, a processor switching contexts of what it was working with is pretty cheap, but no overhead. 
Oh, but wait, security. So now it's much slower by comparison. So this patch to the Linux kernel that will speed up make helps optimize the context switching, which, you know, performance mitigated CPUs helps a lot because you don't have as much context switching, the mitigations don't hurt you as bad. But when you have a competing CPU, AMD, where they were handling context switches pretty well in the first place, you actually get a pretty dramatic performance uplift there as well. And the rabbit holes and our other testing, just as deep and interesting. In fact, I found that if I investigated each sort of questionable Pharaonix result and I dug deep enough, I could improve or optimize the performance on everything from 32 to 64 cores. So you think about it and it's like, okay, I need the performance of this to go faster. You look at it, where is it hanging up at? It's like, oh, it's the pipe structure in the kernel. Okay, let's fix that. Oh, it's IO, let's add more IO. Oh, it's memory or swap or something. Oh, let's add more memory, at least to a point. Previously with a lower number of cores, it might not have been worth the effort to spend the time to do the optimization. But there's a ton of low hanging fruit here now that 64 cores optimizes the performance that you have. You know, Intel working in the server space knows this too. They know there's a lot of low hanging fruit for performance. And that's why they funded a lot of development on a Linux distro called Clear Linux OS. Now it's described on their webpage as an open source rolling release of a Linux, a Linux distribution, in other words, optimized for performance and security, you know, from the cloud to the edge for servers designed for customization and manageability. So with Clear Linux, to be clear, all right, see what I did there? And you're gonna compile your kernel with AMD optimizations instead of Intel. So set up Clear Linux, and then let's do a custom kernel compile. We're looking at a 15 to 20% performance uplift moving from Ubuntu to Clear Linux for a lot of these benchmarks. Pharaonix did a write up on it too. Our Clear Linux testing was in our day one review with Micro Center. But don't just blindly accept that that, you know, looking at the benchmarks and looking at the numbers, I mean, it's a little misleading if you just look at those benchmark numbers in a vacuum. Some of the optimization I did was around speeding up things like disk IO, changing the file system. Turns out ext4 has some of the same kind of bottlenecks and they're, they're kind of starting to be known. Uh, or maybe using a different type of storage, NVMe storage, so like switching out NAND flash for Intel's Optane, which is actually uh, not quite as fast in terms of throughput, but quite a bit faster in terms of latency. It's like half the latency of NAND flash. So we have a lot more interesting benchmarks I haven't even talked about yet. PHP Bench on Clear Linux, 20% faster. You figure that's probably a use case that Intel's optimized for that Intel and AMD both benefit from, which is a pretty awesome situation to be in. Now, what about, uh, you know, multimedia? Oh, it's so hard to resist mentioning multimedia workloads, but everybody knows those are insane. I mean, H.264 and H.265 encodes, well, renders visual effects, that whole enchilada. Threadripper is far and away the uncontested champion. It really, it's, it, it is a complete and utter game changer. Nobody's really disputing that, at least I don't think. But for software developers and that workload, uh, you know, tweaks, improvements, and optimizations are gonna make a big difference. And I'm not really talking about your day-to-day your -day coder, because, you know, a Ryzen 5 3600 all the way up to a 3950X for like a day job developer, not really gonna make a lot of difference. But there are some development workloads where having the Threadripper family of monster CPUs will actually really help you. And I'm gonna talk more about that I think I'll have to break that into a separate video. Oh, I do want to mention Windows really quickly. There's Windows 10 Pro and even server versions of Windows in addition to, you know, like Windows 10 for workstations and Windows 10 Home. Well, forget Home. Home is just, we're never going to talk about that. It's terrible. But some benchmarking will show performance uplift benchmarking the 64 core 3990X on the workstation or server version of Windows 10. But most of that is down to OS defaults, things like the power plan and background services. There's not, it's, <laughs> Microsoft's philosophy is one kernel to rule them all. So Windows struggles to manage more than 64 threads at a time. And currently that is universally true across all those different versions of Windows. Windows splits the 3990X CPU into two groups of 64 threads. So 32 cores, 64 threads, and a processor group. Most applications treat that as a non-uniform memory access NUMA, like a NUMA node. And uh, I covered all that pretty quickly in the Micro Center build video, so I don't really want to rehash it here. But uh, 
you can get just as much of a performance uplift by doing things like enabling message signaled interrupts and, and juggling some of the hardware settings on the system as you can by, you know, throwing out Windows 10 Pro and switching to Windows 10 for workstations. This may not always be true. This may not be true right now when we're talking about like the insider ring of Windows 10, but generally speaking, most of those performance uplift and, opt and stuff like that from like the Pro or server versions is just gonna come from optimizations. So Threader per 3000. This is the highest plateau of computing right now. They all handle lightly threaded loads just as well as many threaded workloads, even on Windows. But currently, the Threader Pro 3000 family really sings best on Linux. And the reason why is simply because there's so many options for tuning the performance on Linux. And even the, the, the performance variance from one Linux distro to another varies almost as much as the performance variance from moving from Windows to Linux. I mean, in our benchmarking, we tested all the cross-platform apps like Blender and Indigo just to see what would happen. Now, for my next project, so I got access to the 3990X. I've been looking at what it takes to optimize and scale up large dev projects. We're gonna see how Threadripper scales up to managing these large open embedded compile projects. So yeah, like open embedded where you're working on a project where you're gonna target not just x86, but MIPS and ARM, and you're gonna do a cross compile, that kind of stuff. It's, it's pretty exciting. We've also got a 40 gigabyte Unreal Engine game that we're gonna compile and see how we can optimize that. And we'll probably put these Threadrippers head to head with the 28 core Intel W3175X. That's on the EVGA Dark SR3 motherboard. That is the best of the best from Intel. It does not get any faster than that. But I've rambled too much. That's enough for this video. There's a lot of really exciting things with the 3990X, but it's gonna depend on researchers and computer scientists uh, to really uh, sort of unlock it for everybody, but it's not as inaccessible as the 2990WX. So like the 2990WX on Linux was a way better experience than Windows, but the 3990X, you don't lose anything. It's at least as fast as the 32 core and has the potential to be like 40% faster. But if we look at some of the bench, I mean like the open SSL benchmark, it's like 90% faster, it's almost twice as fast, and it's almost perfect scaling with open SSL signatures. So there are a few things that are almost twice as fast, but not many. Most things are in that 15 to 40% range, which is pretty good considering, you know, 280 watt CPU. So anyway, I'm rambling. I'm Wendell, this is level one. Welcome if you're new. I'm really looking forward to the next video that talks about what we did with uh, both Unreal and open embedded, like compiling all of open embedded. And if you actually want to get a head start on that, you could probably hit me up on the level one forum and I probably would send you a link to a GitHub repository where you can reproduce what we're doing because that's not something that lives in the Veronix <laughs> test suite. And reproducibility, like that Gromax thing from 2017, is kind of important. All right, I'm signing out. I'll see you later. Yeah.